Hi, I'm Kenny Rice, and thanks for tuning in to this as we get ready for Episode 7 of the Horse Racing Show. We taped this show in advance of Santa Anita making the announcement that they have canceled racing and training indefinitely as they continue to evaluate the safety of its main track. This happened after another horse, sadly, the 21st in 10 weeks, had to be humanely destroyed because of an injury related to the track. What's even compounding the frustration of all this is that no one has a definitive answer as exactly what's going on. They've had experts out there looking at the track, people that know about soil samples, people that know about how a track is supposed to function. There's speculation, of course, because they've had an inordinate amount of rain in Southern California this time of year, around 11 inches or so. Possibly that would have something to do with it. That would make sense. What it is doing right now is compounding everything on the road to the Kentucky Derby because the two top horses, the consensus at least of everyone, the two top horses, game winner and, and improbable, both trained by Bob Baffert, were supposed to run this weekend in the San Felipe at Santa Anita. That race has been postponed. As you know, time is precious and scheduling is of essence as you get ready for the Kentucky Derby now less than two months away. What he'll do then we don't know if the horses will stay in Southern California, try to find another area out there to run in, maybe go to Arkansas or go to New York or to Florida. That's to be determined. But it's a situation that basically is unprecedented. I cannot remember anything like this. So that's the situation at Santa Anita. Some of the things you may hear in the show were taped again before we found out that Santa Anita had closed racing and training for the rest of this week. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. We're glad that you're tuned in. It is time now for our Rude and Riddle, as I point to it, for those of you who are watching us on YouTube. It's time for our vet check, and we're delighted to always have the vets come in each week and hopefully give you a little more information. Even if you're a diehard fan, I think you probably learn a little bit. And Dr. Rolf Embertson is here today to help us out. He is one of the six surgeons at Rude and Riddle Hospitals. And at one time, Dr. Emerson, you were the only surgeon, I believe, in like 1986? That is true. Did yeah, you sleep? So we, <laughs> actually, in the spring, not much. It was, it, honestly, it was a little tough. And it would be hard to find somebody that would want to do that now. But so the, our practice, the, the hospital actually opened its doors in, in March 1986, about, about 33 years ago, something like that. And I was young enough and naive enough, 31 years old at the time, um, to take this job, essentially I was on call all the time. Yeah. Just on call all the time. And, but I, but I loved it. You know, and it was a, it was a good job. It's what I had trained to do. Um, I was at Ohio state university before mm -hmm. that, um, actually truth be known, the Rudin Riddle got my name through Larry Brown, which they tried to hire oh, yeah. Larry first. Yeah. Right. And Larry decided to stay at Ohio state, um, and gave him my name and I ended up down here and, and, uh, haven't looked back. I mean, it's been, it's been a hell of a ride. It's great. So, so what we've done is that we've yeah. built though, you know, for about three and a half years, it was just me. And then we actually were able to talk Brownlidge into coming down from Ohio state in 1989, um, which obviously stepped us up a lot, especially orthopedic wise. Um, and then we've hired some others. Um, you know, we, Dr. Hopper in late nineties, Dr. Ruggles, I think he was on your show yeah. uh, earlier. I think he came in like 2000. Brett Woody came in 2004. One of our surgeons uh, actually does mostly imaging now. Uh -huh. um, she passed her surgery boards. When I say surgeons, you know, we've gone through um, surgical training after veterinary school. So it's mm -hmm. a little bit like the human field, you know, where you, you've got another four, sometimes five years of training before you take this test to get board certified in whatever specialty it is. Um, so then... Um, and another guy that has been doing actually a lot of racehorse stuff is Wes Sutter. He just joined our practice this yeah. year. Um, so actually in Lexington, uh, I guess there's six, six or seven of us boarded surgeons right now. Yeah. And this is getting to be the busy time of year for you as we are getting yeah. now into the spring. And, and Dr. Emerson, I want to talk about especially the most important thing for humans and horses is the ability to breathe. There you go. And you, know, you, you don't have that. You don't have that lung capacity. You can't take in that oxygen. That's all I know. That's my medical expertise. How's that? <laughs> that, that that's all I got. And and so yeah. many times we talk about airway surgeries and with racehorses and uh, 
uh, flipping pallets and all this. Uh, so kind of generically, w- what are the things with these airway surgeries, especially are, are they all little, uh, are they all kind of tedious or is it uh, kind of a common practice uh, with a racehorse? Well, there's, there's different conditions that can occur that, that affect them differently. But the thing you're after is if, if some part of some tissue, a retinoid cartilage or the soft palate, um, uh, the epiglottis is uh, collapsing into the airway, it shuts off airflow. And these guys need all the gas they can get. You know, if, you, if you're going to a racehorse or any kind of athlete that's truly going as fast as they can go, um, they need all the air they can get. So, for instance, a uh, paralyzed arytenoid or a paralyzed flapper, mm-hmm. oftentimes called, um, that will sometimes collapse. If it becomes paralyzed, they can't hold it out of the airway. And so one side works, and al- it's almost always the left side that collapses. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that gets sucked into the airway, it'll shut off half their air supply. Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, you can't press down on the gas pedal hard enough. There's just nothing there. Right. So that shuts them down. And a lot of times you'll see some horses that can get around maybe five furlongs or something like that. And then that muscle that's pulling it out of the airway just quits. It's just too weak, gives it up. And you'll see them quit and stretch, or, you know, uh, six furlongs, something like that. Mm-hmm. So that, that's for the arytenoid. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that. The, the um, soft palate displacing, normally the horse is an obligate nasal breather. Right, they're they're most efficient breathing through their nose, so the the soft palate, you know, just like in us, it separates our mouth from our nose, mm-hmm. and the soft palate in the horse essentially is a structure with a hole in it, and through that hole sticks the retinoid cartilages and the epiglottis epiglottic cartilage, and they form a tight seal around that, and that keeps them breathing through their nose. So if if a horse flips its palate or displaces. Mm-hmm that soft palate comes up above this epiglottic cartilage. And now the horse is trying to breathe partly through the mouth, partly through the nose. And when they're exhaling, this, the back edge of that palate, it's just like us snoring. That's how we make the snoring noise. Right. We'll make this fluttering noise and you can actually hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it obstructs the airflow going out also. So that's another way to obstruct airflow. The, Sometimes tissue from underneath the epiglottic cartilage will come up over the epiglottic cartilage and then trap it. Mm -hmm. And that also can obstruct airflow so they're not getting enough air. So there's several things that can happen. The key is to figure out what exactly it is that's happening and then fix, you know, fix that problem. Yeah. So. Is it, is it fairly easy to understand that now? I mean, can the trainer come to you or call you on the phone and say, uh, uh, Dr. Emberson, I've noticed uh, the, when he comes back from the track when he just had his uh, morning gallop or something that he's he's breathing a little funny. Is it is it that easy to detect for somebody that's been around horses for a while that's not a veterinarian? Yeah, the trainers know. Yeah. They, they, yeah there's typical noises that are made when they flip the palate. And in fact, it's, it's really important sometimes to figure out, especially with a, a displacing palate, of what the trainer, you know, is, is hearing or, or, or seeing because... A lot of times those horses, when you scope them, they look normal. Mm -hmm. It's a dynamic event, right? Um, And so they'll tell us, I mean, this horse flipping his palate, you know, in training in the morning, um, it's it's a problem for them. And and then, you know, you look at the race form too and see where they're, see where they're at, how they're racing, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And you can help figure it out there. But, you know, the the diagnostics um, have gotten better. And I'm sure you've heard of this, but, you know, now we do an awful lot of examination if we're not exactly sure what's going on right. during exercise, you know, with scope in their, yeah. in their nasopharynx during exercise. Mm-hmm. And that's helped us immensely to try to figure out what exactly it is that's obstructing airflow. And, um, it, it, you know, we, we get, get to the point in the 90s where we're using, we're putting horses on the treadmill and, and trying to do it there just a standing scope and we'd stand next to them as they were going. Mm-hmm. Now the technology is such that they have a remote pack on them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's built into their saddle pad. Mm-hmm. You can put a scope in their nose and you can stand on the side of the track and see, see what's going on. You know, and it, and it helps, you know, to, to then put it on a computer and slow it down and figure that out. Yeah. You don't want a mouth breather horse, do you? No. 
you know, you, you probably don't want a mouth breather human come to think of it, you know, when you're out <laughs> running for those that are seriously competitors. Uh, you, you, you probably don't want that. You know, some people ask me uh, after a race, it's, it's not uncommon to see some blood around the nostrils. I mean, yeah. it, it happens. Yes, it does. I, it, yeah. I'd say maybe not uncommon. I don't know. But no, it's it, not it, uncommon. It, it, you yeah. know, you see it. And, and to those that uh, watch it casually or they're not, not much at the track and all, I think there's concern. Is this horse hurt? Is this, what's it doing? Was yeah. this horse well, bleeding? You know, that's coming from the lungs, right? Yeah. The, the vast majority of the time right. it's coming from the lungs. H- humans do this. Yeah. You know, um, so, and it will shut a horse down if they, if they bleed and it's coming up from the lungs. It, it, it obstructs airflow deeper, you mm-hmm. know, in the lower airway. Um, and that, that's a problem that, it's not a surgical problem. Um, that's more of a medical kind of a problem. And a lot of times it's time mm-hmm. that you got to allow things to heal. Right. And, and, you know, to try to solve some of that too, you're, you're trying to figure out how much inflammation there is in the airway. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some medication that we can we can give them to, to try to help with that, to, to decrease the inflammation. Right. Is there a surgery out there that just is, is tougher? I mean, I'm going to go back to human terms. It's almost now commonplace. I've had family and friends go through like bypass surgeries, mm-hmm. heart bypass at one time was, was an iffy proposition yeah. 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know with horses, is there still that injury that, that you would have to tell the owner, uh, th- this is one of those things. It's it's not a routine surgery. This is a, a serious. Uh, of all the wonderful things we can do, this one is still an iffy proposition. Yeah, it, regarding the upper airway. Yes, the um, you know the the collapsing of the arytenoid. Sometimes that there's some horses that actually get an inflamed or a thickened arytenoid. Mm-hmm. or arytenoid chondritis. I don't know if you've heard that term or I've not. I've heard the term. I don't know what it means, well, actually. But well, what that is is a, actually an inflammation of the cartilage itself and the tissues surrounding it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes early on in that, it'll look like they're a roar or a, or a um, paralyzed arytenoid. Mm-hmm. That surgery, once that, or once that arytenoid becomes thickened and it's not pulling all the way out of the airway, Trying to do a tie back on that to pull that arytenoid out of the airway doesn't work well. The cartilage is is uh, changed; it doesn't hold suture well, and so the surgery we do for that is actually remove that arytenoid. Mm-hmm. So those horses, if we do that, they can still come back and race, but that's a tough that's a tough surgery to do and have them come back and race well. Yeah. So they can get back to the track, but. You know, if you, in general, you don't want to have that problem in your horse. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I know you're busy this time of the year, doctor. I appreciate you coming in. And uh, I guess yeah. what you're busy all the way through the racing season now, right? I mean. Yeah. A lot, you know, a lot of stuff in Lexington, we're kind of getting yearlings ready for the sale. Right. You know, seeing mares that are foaling and, and some of the problems they have with that. Some, seeing some of the babies, some of the problems on top of the racehorse stuff that, that's coming in. Mm-hmm. Um but um, it's, it's a mix of everything right now. Doctor, thanks for your work. Thanks for your time. We always appreciate the rude and riddle vet checks. Not a problem. All Thank right. you very much for having me. He came from surgery, by the way, didn't you? I mean, you're like, how many surgeries have you done today? Yeah, we're just four or five today. But it's, it's actually, it's not a very busy day yet. We're, we're getting into the busy season. So. Ralph Emerson, how many surgeries have you done in one day? Do you even have an idea? Um, in our, well, myself, maybe 12 um, maybe, maybe a, a year, 13 in our practice. So with that many surgeons, yeah. sometimes in the spring, we'll do 25 to 30 surgeries a day. Wow. Yeah. That's that, a lot. That's a lot. Doctor, thanks yep. again for your time. Thank you. Thanks for watching us. We'll be back with more of the horse racing show. Remember to follow us and subscribe on the YouTube channel at the horse racing show. You can follow us on Twitter at horse racing show, like us on Facebook, listen to us on iTunes and Google play and stay with us more to come.